Hello, hello. Happy Pride Month, everybody, and welcome to our very special Pride edition of Grid Talks. I see people trickling in. Uh, welcome to, to Grid Talks, another Grid Talks. Um, today, uh, our Grid Talk is called People, Planet, and Pride, uh, Why queer, queer Liberation is an Environmental Justice Issue. Um, if you don't know much about Grid Talks, it was created uh, really to bring environmental justice leaders, renewable energy leaders into the same space, into the same virtual space um, where we can discuss clean energy access and how that should lead to community-centered solutions. So um, these webinars really exist to uh, amplify the voices of our diverse and loving communities and share their stories, uh, share their experiences and the wonderful work that is creating impact and the systemic changes that need to happen. Um, my name is Daniel Jose Deza, and my uh, pronouns are he, him, his. I am the Director of Storytelling and Communications here at Grid Alternatives. Um, and welcome everybody. Thank you for being here, for taking the time to just be a part of this wonderful discussion, this very important discussion, this groundbreaking discussion. Um, and welcome. I see a lot of you have, you know, you're joining and being a part of this. And I ask that y'all, uh, introduce yourself into the chat, introduce where you're sitting, uh, what you're doing, uh, share an emoji, how you feel on this Monday, you know, Monday, maybe you got the Monday blues, let's turn into some, a Monday rainbow with this discussion. So um, yeah, feel free to, to, to introduce yourself. Um, so with that, I want to get started and we're going to kind of go over some logistics first, just to make sure that y'all know what's going on. Um, so uh, first, this webinar is being recorded, so um, that's so that, you know, at the end of this, we'll be sending an email with that recording so y'all can rewatch it or reshare it or, you know, share it with folks that you think that didn't make it or and should know this information. It's also for folks who didn't make it as well. Um, also, your video and audio is automatically recorded, but or it's automatically muted, excuse me, and, um, but you can still comment in the chat. Uh, and if you have any questions, we ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom, and then that will be something that we'll be keeping an eye on, because at the end of this webinar, we set some time to ask those questions to our wonderful three panelists. So with that, uh, the next thing is I'm going to introduce our three wonderful panelists. Um, we, our first one is uh, Brandon Rothrock, pronouns he, him, his. Uh, he is the Assistant Program Manager uh, of energy efficiency at TRC companies. Um, also, he is the board member, one of the board members for Out for Sustainability. Hello, Brandon, welcome. Um, our next person is Leo Goldsmith, pronouns he, him, they, senior climate and health specialist at ICF and also a board member for Out for Sustainability. Um, and last but definitely not least, a fellow GRID family member, Stella Ursua. Um, and pronouns she, her, hers, Senior Program and Partnership Manager at Grid Alternatives Los Angeles. Welcome, you three. Wonderful to see your faces. Thank you and happy Pride. Um, so let's see, we're here to talk about um, how LGBTQ rights and the environmental justice uh, movement intersect. Um, and also, you know, we brought together these LGBTQ environmental experts here today to really dive deep into the climate crisis and answer the question why queer liberation is an environmental justice issue. Um, climate change compounds the struggles of trans and queer people all over the world. And so we're here to unpack how climate policy, how environmental injustices and geography can lead to LGBTQ disparities, but also how can renewable energy uh, be a part of that solution. So. I also want to recognize that the word queer, as it's used today, um, we know that the word queer can be triggering for some folks because of its derogatory history, that it's when it was used, how it was used in the past. Um, but I want to stress that today is a safe space. Um, it's a safe space we're here together to talk about this and also a place where uh, it has been reclaimed as an umbrella term, um, an umbrella term that crosses borders and encompasses queer and trans people of all cultures and lived experiences whose gender identity and sexual orientation has been made to feel othered. Um, and we also want to recognize that today is the seventh anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting. Um, so let's honor those, the, the victims, the, the folks that have passed today 
um, but also honor the community that they're a part of, the community that we're also all a part of here in this panel and folks here uh, in, in, in the, as, as attendees as well. Um, let's honor the community and the resilience throughout time uh, because to live as your authentic, authentic self can sometimes come with resistance and to stand up against that norm is true bravery. And this is what that community is all about. That's what our community is all about. So with that, I will stop talking so we can get grid talking. And I would like to uh, ask our panelists to really share about your current role in the industry, share us a little bit about yourself um, and let's get started. So let's start with you, Brandon. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brandon. I am the Assistant Program Manager of Energy Efficiency at TRC Companies in New Jersey, uh, where I help to manage New Jersey's residential new construction program. Uh, so providing incentives for um, building to Energy Star and Zero Energy Ready Home Standards across the state. Um, we essentially work as a part of the state um, arm essentially for that. Um, I also work for Environmental Defense Fund um, as an engagement manager on their Climate Corps team, uh, mostly helping to uh, facilitate engagements with um, environmental justice focused work that's happening through um, some graduate fellowships over the summer. Um, and yeah, I'm also a board member uh, like Leo for Out for Sustainability. Um, we are a organization that focuses on climate resilience and environmental justice by and for the LGBTQ plus community. Wonderful, thank you. Leo, if you could go next. Yeah, absolutely. Just first wanna say thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm a senior climate and health specialist at ICF, which is, it doesn't stand for anything. So it's, uh, it's like a consulting company um, that does a wide variety of different issues um, focused on environment and health. Um, and then also, so for ICF, I'm contracted out to the US Global Change Research Program, where I coordinate a federal interagency working group on climate and health. Um, and then I'm also a coordinator for three chapters of the Fifth National Climate Assessment, which will be coming out later this year. Um, so that's the air quality chapter, human health chapter, and also the indicators appendix. I'm also a technical contributor um, on sexual and gender minorities for the human health chapter. And so once that is published, it will be the first time um, that any national climate assessment in the US has had mention or even a whole section on sexual and gender minorities. Um, and then I'm also a researcher of um, sexual and gender minority health and really in relation to climate related disasters. Um, and then I'm also a out for us board member. Wonderful, thank you. And Stella? Yes, thank you, uh, Danny. Thanks everyone on the on the call for for joining us, and uh, much thanks to Brandon, Brandon, and Leo for being part of this. My name is Stella Ursua. I'm the Senior Programs and Partnerships Manager at the LA Office for Grid Alternatives. I use she/her pronouns. Uh, and so my role here at uh, GRID is basically to, um, to engage the community, um, you know, local cities, uh, nonprofits, community-based organizations um, to partner on upcoming grants, um, to look for those grant opportunities, and to um, determine how we might, um, you know, we might be able to bring more folks into, um, into the grant opportunities, but as well the project opportunities that are created as a result. Been with the organization for six and a half years now uh, and very thrilled to be part of this organization. Before this, I spent 20 years in organizational development, HR and training. Um, I was laid off in 2009 during the Great Recession. And so it was time to reinvent my Myself and to figure out how I could use these skills to move into a green industry. I read Van Jones's book, The Green Collar Economy, uh, back in 2008, and it sold me. It was exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, shortly after that, I volunteered at the VA uh, in Long Beach, the Veterans Administration, um, during a time when uh, people from uh, Iraq, as, from, veterans from Iraq, Af Afghanistan were coming back to the U.S., um, and so there were there was a lot of thought around you know what how can we support these individuals uh, as they return uh, to the states. 
Um, I was hired as the first green jobs coordinator at the US Veterans Initiative in Long Beach. Um, and back then there weren't a heck of a lot of uh, green jobs, but we did train 46 veterans in energy efficiency and advanced automotive skills. Um, like I said, not a lot of jobs, uh, but it was a it was a start, and we had some folks that actually connected to uh, jobs in those uh, particular industries. I also had a a nonprofit back then called Green Education, um, and basically it was just to engage communities uh, on on climate change, sustainability, to introduce them to um, folks that were doing the work out throughout um, the Long Beach area, Long Beach and LA area. And um, so we uh, conducted a yearly Earth Day event called the Green Prize Festival and uh, had thousands of people that used to attend those, uh, those festivals. It was a lot of fun, but uh, really it uh, gave me uh, the opportunity to connect with so many folks out there. And then finally, I started doing a, a, uh, a workshop on uh, green jobs. I called it, what the heck is a green collar job? Because nobody knew back then what it was. <laughs> and so that led me to Grid Alternatives. Uh, and like I said, I've been here about six and a half years. Thanks, Danny. Uh, wonderful, yeah. I'm just gonna say, y'all are so cool. Like, so cool. Y'all are doing really wonderful things and are pioneers really in this 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 clean energy movement and environmental justice movement and, and when it comes to LGBTQ rights too, especially. So, you know, thank you for, for that introduction and, and sharing with us that. So the first question, we're gonna jump into it, um, which is, you know, what does the intersection of LGBTQ populations and environmental justice looks like for you? And how has your lived experience inspired what it is that you do as well? Um, I'd like to, let's start with you, Leo, uh, with that question. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so I actually want to flip those two questions and say that my lived experience is really what led me to connect um, LGBTQI plus communities with environmental justice. Um, so I grew up with a brown Colombian mother and a white American father, and we were uh, low income. My parents were still low income. And so very quickly, I was hyper aware of um, classism that we faced, as well as the racism that my mom had to deal with um, pretty consistently. And so when I went to college, which was a primarily white wealthy institution, um, I noticed you know, who wasn't in the room, what voices were being prioritized. And that was later kind of honed um, when I uh, went into environmental studies as my major was a focus on environmental justice. And so through that academic learning and also in practice and supporting environmental justice organizations, um, I really had an eye for like, okay, like who's missing from this and who's not being um, talked about. Um, and so after college, I came out as pansexual and transmasculine and that came with its own uh, you know, amounts of uh, struggle. And afterwards, when I went to graduate school at the Yale School of the Environment, I actually ended up uh, shifting from environmental justice um, work to uh, focusing on climate and health because climate change, you know, very big issue. And I didn't know very much about it and I wanted to learn more. And I wanted to focus on health because the health disparities aspect of environmental justice is what I was really most passionate about. Um, and as I was, you know, reading through the literature and kind of learning more about the infrastructure that was in place, I noticed that sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, and gender expression wasn't actually included within um, that literature and infrastructure. Um, and so based on my own experiences and also um, other like academic learning that I knew about LGBTQ plus health, I was like, oh, you know, these two things could very potentially like um, LGBTQI plus communities could very well be disproportionately impacted by environmental injustices or climate change. And through research found that that is very much the case. And so I want to leave off and just say that, you know, LGBTQI plus communities are a part of every population. They're extremely diverse. And so no matter what population you're working with, you know, if you're working with um, primarily those who are experiencing environmental injustices, LGBTQI plus communities are always going to be a part of that population. And so you'll need to have an understanding of their needs and also historical context as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Um, Stella? 
Um, Danny, can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, sure. Um, how has your lived experience inspired what you do? And what does the intersection of LGBTQ plus populations environmental justice looks like for you as well? Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, I have a lot of experience in, in HR and training, workforce development. Um, and before I came to GRID, you know, it was always about helping someone develop their, their skills, their potential, their, you know, their knowledge, expertise, et cetera. And, and then, so once I made that move um, into, you know, more of the, the green jobs area, you know, it was like, okay, how can I connect folks uh, to these jobs? Because they're good jobs, right? Uh, they have so much potential, uh, so much social value. And there are parts of our, uh, uh, you know, the cities that we live in that don't have access to this information, don't have access to the um, opportunities to work in, in these particular industries. And so I, I committed to that. You know, I, I was laid off, left, you know, uh, you know a, a pretty comfortable area um, that I was, I was you know, uh, familiar with. And it was like, okay, I'm gonna learn all about, you know, these different industries. And again, just thinking about how I could, could connect folks. Folks, and so that's what I've been doing since you know 2009, 2010. Is just really focused on making sure that uh, folks that live in uh, under-resourced communities, LGBTQ plus communities, that um, they know about um, about these industries. They know about these jobs. We need we need uh, designers. We need, yes, absolutely installers, but we need folks that know how to manage projects, um, you know, how to uh, outreach, how to engage folks, um, you know, at every level of, of the communities that we work. And so, you know, I, I think it had a lot to do with my training background that I said, okay, you know, we're just gonna take these skills and we're gonna move them over here. And I have had the most fun. Um, you know, for these past, uh, you know, 10 years, I don't know how many years it's been now, maybe more. Uh, but, you know, it's been so exciting to be able to move into this role and to, to just show folks that, you know, there are some some great opportunities here. Wonderful. Yeah. Making sure that our community has a seat at the table, right? Like Absolutely. making sure that's very important. Thank you, Stella. Um, Brandon, how about you? Yeah, um, I think I would speak to my lived experience first. Um, so I would say I grew up in a very small town in rural Northwest New Jersey, um, and I was always super fascinated with meteorology. Um, I wanted to be a weatherman. Um, I was super interested in weather from a very young age. Um, and I would say like Leo, when I came to college, um, I felt like that was the space that I really sort of came to terms and grappled with my own sexual identity. Um, and also found geography as well. So um, within the discipline of geography, um, I mostly focus on human environment interaction research. Um, and so as I was thinking about my sexuality, also thinking about the environment, I was really thinking about um, and reading up on gender geography, queer geography, and sort of figuring out how LGBTQ people um, and how identity in general uh, basically um, affects how people move through different spaces. So for example, um, thinking about how your identity might affect it the way you see things in a museum or the way you might act or perform or perceive yourself in a different state or town based on um, different circumstances outside your own identity. Um, and I would also then piggyback off of what Leo was saying, uh, where how LGBTQ people are part of all communities um, and I would also mention as well that um, the lack of LGBTQ plus protections, especially at a federal level and within the United States uh, more broadly, um, those sort of lack of protections create disadvantaged populations. Um, and uh, the LGBTQ population is definitely a part of that disadvantaged uh, community. Um, and I would say on top of that, that uh, those sort of lack of protections in everyday life uh, definitely shift themselves into disaster um, or also uh, different issues of climate change. So um, I think particularly one example um, of a transgender woman named Charlie Vix, uh, who was arrested for using the women's bathroom in a um, hurricane shelter in Houston, Texas, following Hurricane Katrina. 
So that example really showcases sort of how the lack of protections for LGBTQ people in everyday spaces are then ac accelerated and prevalent in disaster spaces as well. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. And, and I love this like common theme of like, and truth, which is our community is everywhere, right? We are everywhere. Um, and, you know, we, as us being everywhere, we, the resources that we need to be a part of the spaces also need to exist everywhere, right? So wonderful. Um, so let's get to the next question. Uh, Leo, this one's for you. If you could tell us a bit more about the research you've conducted and if you can elaborate uh, on what environmental exposures impact the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, um, I've written two articles, one on environmental justice impacts um, and the, and the American Journal of Public Health, which is in the chat, and then another one on disaster impacts on LGBTQI plus communities um, that was published in the Disaster Journal, which is also in the chat. Um, and so uh, first I wanna kind of start off and say, um, so back to like the point about LGBTQ plus communities being part of all communities, there's something that's called the myth of gay affluence. And so what that means is that in the media, we primarily see wealthy, white, gay, cis men, um, which basically then, uh, you know, doesn't represent the majority of the community and also provides this like uh, uh, myth that um, LGBTQI plus communities are all right because they are all, you know, well taken care of. Um, but in reality, LGBTQI plus communities are more likely to live in poverty. Um, they're more likely to be unhoused, have a chronic illness, um, such as cardiovascular disease or a variety of different respiratory disorders. Um, also, um, uh, more likely to have a mental illness, such as anxiety, depression, PTSD. Um, more likely to have uh, no access to healthcare or um, are discriminated within the healthcare setting, um, as well as um, more likely to be incarcerated. And so um, to give you like an example on how um, environmental exposures yeah. might exacerbate that. Um, so let's say you have somebody who identifies as, um, as transgender. Um, they are unhoused. And we know from um, research that uh, same-sex couples, at least, um, are more likely to live in neighborhoods that have higher levels of hazardous air pollution, which can lead to higher rates of cancer incidents and also respiratory illnesses, um, such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. And so you have somebody who's exposed um, not only to potentially uh, more air pollution than somebody else, they're also more exposed because they're on house to extreme heat and they may not be able to access a shelter um, on the basis of their gender um, because of discrimination. And this is uh, um, not legal for federal shelters currently under this administration, but if it's not a federally funded shelter, then they are legally um, allowed to discriminate depending on the state laws. Um, and as we know, there are a lot of suits currently that are um, putting out a lot of very anti-trans policies out there. Um, and so you have the exposure, you have the social, economic, and health disparities, and you also have the lack of access to services. Um, to put this kind of in perspective to um, an event that did happen, although we have no research for extreme heat, we do for hurricanes. Um, so during Hurricane Maria and Irma, there were many pharmacies that were destroyed or shut down, which meant that transgender individuals weren't able to access their home hormone replacement therapy, um, so estrogen or testosterone. And also um, folks weren't able to access, for example, HIV medications. Um, they weren't able to, for example, um, if there was a power outage because of the hurricane, they weren't able to refrigerate um, any of their medications that may require that. And also for those that use electronic medical devices, they have no power to those. And so for um, LGBTQI plus individuals who have disabilities, that could be um, extremely necessary to have. Um, I also wanna mention that, you know, a lot of this, uh, 
isn't research. So um, what I have in those two papers are all that's really written within peer reviewed articles in the US. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but there are a lot of stories out there of folks who um, have experienced this. And unfortunately, um, in order for it to be val uh, to be considered valid, it has to be written um, in a peer reviewed journal. So I'll end there. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, um, it makes me think of, you know, these being the two pieces that you're saying, the research papers, you know, I can't imagine all of the other things that have not even been touched, right, or the stories that we can read about in papers and newspapers or hear from friends and members of our community, but how many of that has not actually been researched and put into an academic paper to take be taken seriously, right? So thank you for, for pouting that, yeah. Um, Brandon, uh, the next question is for you. What roles, what role does geography play in making sure members of our community have a seat at the table? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would definitely start by saying that geography is a study of really anything, uh, mostly people, places, and things. Um, and I would say that geography is a super powerful tool to understand climate change through the lens of human environment interactions. Um, Essentially, geography as a discipline really connects physical sciences and social sciences together. Um, and I would say that geography has helped me at least sort of contribute to meaningful research on the ground within the LGBTQ community, especially in places or spaces that are often neglected or forgotten. Um, so for example, um, I did my master's research at West Virginia University, um, where I assessed how gender identity and sexual identity um, of undergraduate students at large public universities in Appalachia were thinking about climate change. Um, and it was really super eye-opening research um, because Appalachia itself is often seen as um, sort of an unsavable region in the United States, um, often seen as an extraction zone uh, for natural resources. And sort of a mainstream narrative is that people don't necessarily care who lives there um things like that and i would say it's definitely super helpful um like leo was saying to definitely produce research um around climate change in the lgbtq community because it really helps showcase sort of that people lgbtq plus people do live in these spaces um not all of us live in new york or la or other urban spaces that we assume to be very lgbtq friendly um and so sort of going back to your question Daniel, um, about having a seat at the table, I would definitely say that having more resources and more research around LGBTQ populations that live in very rural areas in the US is definitely helpful um, and would help us better understand how we can move people uh, and bring everyone to the table as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, what, exactly. I mean, we're everywhere, right? That's what we've been saying. We're everywhere and even in rural spaces where you know, but people might not have the the resources that they need to feel like they can stay or talk about or come out or whatever. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And Stella, the the next question is for you, uh, kind of more on a renewable energy kind of perspective, your expertise, right? So, um, can you share some solar projects that Grid has worked on um, that work with the LGBTQ plus community? Um, you know, and and how does the LGBT community, how can they be a part of the conversation working towards a just transition to clean energy? Absolutely, Danny. Um, you know, I can think of a couple of projects that we did uh, within the last couple of years. So we have uh, a project up in, I believe it was Sacramento called the Lavender Courtyard. Um, it was uh, affordable housing um, uh, complex for 53 senior tenants who are LGBTQ+. Um, and it was a 36.7 uh, KW uh, solar system. And then we have the LGBT Center of Long Beach. Uh, they received a little smaller of a unit, 17.2 um, KW uh, solar energy system. And um, I was involved with the, the center at um, in Long Beach. I was the former uh, president and chair for the board. And so this one just, you know, really uh, tickled me because you know, it was an opportunity for uh, this organization, along with Lavender Courtyard, I'm sure, to save precious dollars, excuse me, that could be redirected 
to programs and services that are vital to the LGBTQ community and to our most vulnerable community members. Um, so, you know, they're going to save, um, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars um, over the course of the, the lifetime of the, of the systems. But, but as well, you know, it's important that the, the LGBTQ plus community be part of this conversation um, for all those reasons that Brandon and, and Leo just mentioned, right? Um, we have seniors that are in house. We have uh, young adults that, you know, were kicked out of their homes because they, you know, they came out. Um, and so we want to make sure that there's places uh, that are safe, um, but also that can um, provide, uh, you know, lower energy bills, um, you know, opportunities to, uh, to connect to potential jobs and careers, uh, both in clean energy and transportation, um, and, and to connect folks to good family sustaining jobs. So I think those are just some of the reasons that, you know, it's important that this connection is made throughout, you know, throughout all those areas that we serve. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. That economic mobility, right, that that the community needs to really Absolutely. thrive. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, uh, the next question is uh, for you, Brent, Brandon and Leo, uh, about Out for Sustainability, a really interesting, unique uh, organization that you both are board members on. Um, can you share with us the mission uh, of your of your uh, organization and also any projects that you all might be working on that you think we should know about that connect to environmental justice and LGBTQ community? Yeah, sure. Um, I can definitely start for us. Um, so yeah, Leo and I have been board members at Out for Sustainability for about a year now. Um, and prior to us joining, um, Out for Us was uh, created in 2008, sort of as a way to um, create networking opportunities for LGBTQ people that were interested in the environmental space. Um, and to also focus on sort of greening pride events. So um, one focus that Out For Us um, had and still has to this day is Plastic Free Pride, um, which is an initiative just to showcase uh, plastic pollution at, at Pride um, and sort of ways that we can better make Pride more sustainable as a community. Um, and I would also say as well, over the past year, um, specifically, we helped form Out For Us's first strategic plan um, and so we also redefined our mission through the strategic plan. And so our current mission is to co-create a platform uh, for climate resilience and environmental justice by and for the LGBTQ community. And so through our strategic plan, um, we've had a bunch of different initiatives, uh, but mainly the four pillars of our strategic plan are representation, uh, participation, redistribution, and transformation. Um, and so over the past few months, we've been working sort of in each of those areas as a board um, to move the organization forward in this new vision. Um, I'll definitely pass it over to Leo, who can maybe give some more insight on some of the projects that we're working on. Thank you, Brandon. And I just want to say Brandon has been so amazing and so critical to the creation of the strategic plan. And yeah, and when like definitely go check it out. It's amazing. Um, and so we have a few initiatives that uh, we're currently working on. Uh, one um, is called uh, the Q Ready Initiative, um, which is uh, resilience preparedness by and for LGBTQI plus communities, especially for those who are multiply marginalized. Um, and so we have a, this is my cat, <laughs> sorry everyone. Uh, we have a wonderful director, uh, named Vanessa Raditz, who is a PhD student at the University of Georgia and also one of my co-authors for the Queer and Present Danger um, article on disaster impacts. Um, and so what they do is they uh, oversee fiscal sponsorships of um, Puerto Rican grassroots organizations uh, working um, um, who are, are like founded by LGBTQI plus individuals and that work in the climate space. Um, and so because grassroots organizations aren't able to receive grants, um, we as like a nonprofit can then receive those grants and then distribute those to um, local communities um, who need it the most. Um, a lot of philanthropy like 
barely any, it's a very small, it's like less than 1% um, go to, um, or it's like one or 2% goes to LGBTQ plus communities. And even, and there's like no data out there on how much of that goes to disasters or climate change and LGBTQ plus communities. Um, we also have a, uh, we did a collaboration with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Region 9, which is California, um, as well as the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Face-Based Organization Center for Face-Based Organizations and Neighborhood Partnerships. Um, and so uh, in March, we did a webinar um, that had four panelists and a FEMA moderator uh, focused on uh, before disasters, um, so preparedness and mitigation for LGBTQI plus communities, and so considerations for emergency managers. Um, and then in April, we had another webinar focused on after disasters, um, so response and recovery. Um, and so we also had another four um, panelists um, with another FEMA moderator. And so the panelists were from like uh, federal government, from um, community centers, from uh, nonprofits and art centers. And so we had a wide variety of perspectives um, give their input uh, to uh, primarily emergency managers and face based organizations working in the disaster space. From that, we collected all that input. And then we turned that into a set of recommendations um, for emergency managers. Um, in a, I think it's like 18 page report that is coming out today. Um, I unfortunately don't have a link for you at the moment, but please uh, look out in the follow up email. Um, I think it'll be a really cool read. And it's uh, pretty much the only thing of its kind, um, at least in the US. And so, yeah, it's uh, very exciting um, that we were able to get that done. Um, and yeah. Am I missing anything, Brandon? Okay. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think we're good. Um, yeah, I also would like to shout out Leo, uh, who helped write the FEMA report. Um, it's an excellent report that will be coming out. So I highly recommend checking that out. Um, and I would just also like to mention as well that um, we are a all volunteer board as well. Um, and so, yeah, our organization, we all have different uh, full-time jobs and things like that, but we all volunteered together to move the nonprofit forward. Wonderful, thank you for sharing all that. I think one thing that really like, I mean, that's incredible that this is coming out. Well, definitely to all attendees, we're going to add that to once we have that link, we're gonna add it to the email that'll come out after with the recording. So we can all read it for the first time together. Um, so thank you to your organization really for be making that happen like these are the steps that as we said earlier in the webinar that need to be happening right for the community the research the advocacy of it and um and even just how, what you were saying about the for out for sustainability in the beginning of what you find you know, when you were all founded about um plastics and how things that are being used in pride like i even think that's wonderful in a sense to kind of even look within our own community right and how what are we doing um to reduce waste as well i mean how many little baggies from pride have we kept and thrown away and that we don't even use so it's sort of that's wonderful that that's also another element of your organization um so cool thank you for for sharing all that and i think the next question um let's see so all right so now with all of this great work that we've just talked about um where do queer folks and the environmental justice movement intersect and what actions um do you believe that need to be taken to reverse some of these disparities that we've we've talked about today. Um, uh, let's see, Stella, if you would like to go first. Sure, sure. Th thank you, Danny. Um, you know, I was thinking about this question, uh, you know, where do we interse intersect, what actions need to be taken? You know, a quick example, for example, after we, we were able to connect the, L the Long Beach Center to the solar energy system, I started talking to the executive director about resilience centers. He had mm -hmm. never heard about resilient centers, right? And he, he started thinking about it and, and we just started brainstorming, like, why is this important, right? Well, you know, you include the resilient center as part of the center, right? And now you have more and more folks that are not necessarily LGBTQ plus 
uh, members, right, that start to, you know, learn not only about, uh, about climate change and about extreme heat and, you know, all the other issues, the health issues that, that come with, you know, uh, our, our, our temperatures just getting warmer and warmer, right, but you start to teach folks about the center itself and what types of programs and services are available, right, what types of people are utilizing those services, what are the challenges, what are the successes and what are the gaps, right? What are the gaps? And, you know, maybe we get some folks from other communities that then become very supportive of that effort. Because at the end of the day, both, both um, you know, LGBTQ plus and, and straight folks are going to be using that resi resilience center to stay, uh, to, excuse me, to stay, stay safe, right? Uh, and, and that's what we want. And that's, how we start to, you know, just bring the two, you know, different entities together. So that's just a quick example. Thank you. Yes, very much. Yeah. And um, uh, Leo, if you could give us your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, just to reiterate, um, so the way that, you know, we kind of both intersect is um, LGBTQI plus communities are part of our all populations. Um, and so, uh, for example, like 40% of LGBTQI plus individuals identify as people of color and 40% of unhoused youth identify as LGBTQ plus. Um, and so any community, um, including environmental justice um, communities, um, intersect with LGBTQI plus communities and having those kind of like overlaying, um, compounding like systemic oppression only makes it worse. Um, and so for actions to kind of help mitigate that, um, something that I found um, through my research is that uh, there's a, an act called the, the Robert T. Stafford Act. And Section 308 is the non-discrimination policy. They only use the word sex and so in relation to anything related to gender and sexual orientation. Um, and so that means that you can or at least the administration that is um, in office at the time can interpret that how they would like. Um, so in a more conservative administration, they can identify or they can define that as, um, you know, there's only man and woman and it's immutable and that um, you should prioritize um, opposite sex um, couples. And, um, and then for, or I guess heterosexual couples actually, sorry. And then also, um, Currently in this administration, you can um, they, the way that they define it is like the entirety of you know sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, and gender expression. And so until it's actually like codified into law, um, that is always going to be kind of up in the air. And so that only applies to federally funded um, disaster response programs. Um, and so it's very important to be very explicit. Um, within not only non-discrimination policies in the federal government, but in all levels of government and organizations. I think it's also very important to have cultural humility training um, mandatory on all access of different identities, not include, so like including LGBTQI plus communities, but much more, um, as well as, you know, different climate plans, different renewable energy plans, different disaster plans. So should all um, either be updated to include LGBTQ plus, language um, in conjunction with LGBTQ plus communities and leaders, but also, you know, at, if once, like if you're writing those plans, um, at the very beginning, LGBTQI plus communities needs and voices um, should be right there up in front. Um, and also um, wanting to mention too, like the main thing is like communicating with LGBTQI plus communities, which I think is something that Stella has mentioned a lot about. And that connection um, is really, really key, especially like in environmental justice. You'll hear a lot like you need to, you know, procedural justice. Um, you need to talk with the community. It needs to be co-created. Um, otherwise, it could have unintentional like harms um, caused. Um, or you might be overlooking some sort of needs, resources, or services that LGBTQI plus communities need or other communities need. Um, and so, yeah, definitely from the very beginning, need to have those conversations, bring those people in, do that outreach, tailor the communications towards those communities. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Brandon, what about you? 
Yeah, um, I think that Stella and Leo definitely spoke a lot about the intersections. So I think um, I might just talk about the actions needed. Um, I would definitely say education is definitely one of the biggest things. Um, I would say education of localized impacts of climate change and then also education, like Leo said, geared towards the LGBTQ population, but also abroad or broadly as well. Um, I would say just thinking about my own master's research that a lot of the students that I interviewed could understand sort of climate change as an out there phenomenon happening in different places and spaces and things like that, but not necessarily understanding the climate change impacts in their own backyard. Um, and so I would say more research and then also the co-creation of community engagement and materials and things like that would definitely be super helpful um, in this area. And yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much. Great, great, great thoughts, great, I, great things to panelists, all of you, that was really, really wonderful, thank you. Um, and the next question, really with all of this, you know, looking back on all your work, what are you the most proud of and what are you looking forward to in the future? Uh, uh, Brandon, how about you again? Yeah, um, so I would say one of the things I was definitely the most proud of um, was I helped to create environmental defense funds for first ever environmental justice landscape report. Um, so essentially the report, as I was a fellow at EDF, uh, we were looking at all of the different facets of the organization and sort of really seeing what we were doing in terms of environmental justice is one of the big greens, uh, you could say, for the US in particular, um, and sort of understanding, you know, how we're engaging our communities, are we engaging them in a just and equitable way? Um, and yeah, just like understandings from that, I would definitely say was something that I am super proud of to help work on. Um, and looking forward, um, I would say I'm definitely looking forward to continuing my research um, in academia in the future. Um, I will be attending the Ohio State University for my PhD in the fall in geography. Um, so I'd like to do some more energy work um, around LGBTQ livelihoods and then also um, just transition and sort of how we can move away from fossil fuels and towards a more just and equitable um, space. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Stella, what about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, I think for me, what I'm most proud of is um, connecting uh, community members to our, our programs and services. Uh, connecting them to potential, you know, training and, and jobs. Uh, and then I mentioned the Resilience Center and just being able to, to plant those seeds, because to be honest with you, um, I, I interact with about two or three different centers here in Southern California, and it was, you know, complete mystery. And so just, you know, breaking that down, um, I think um, Brandon really stressed, you know, that the, the um, the criticality of uh, communication and education, right? That that has to happen to to get people up to speed. And um, so I think I've tried my little ways, you know, whether it's the the Earth Day events or the workshops, right? I had a workshop at the center a um, couple of years ago, and there were maybe like twelve young adults in the room, and uh, two people came up to me and asked about um, potential uh, training programs. And another person asked about uh, electric cars. That was a success, you know? I mean, if, if I can get a couple people come to me at the end of the day and say, hey, I wanna learn more. Hey, I wanna connect to one of those jobs. Success, that's, that's what makes me most proud. Oh, future, future state, just being able to help our community grow in the space and, um, continue adding the green to our rainbow. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Stella. Uh, Leo, yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say that um, I'm really most proud of uh, two things. So one, um, you know, I've had a couple of people who have reached out to me um, who are like undergoing like undergraduate or graduate program and saying like, I read your work and it like really opened my eyes and like, this is like what I want to do. And I was just like, that, that was like a moment where I really just 
you know, it, it's a very defining moment in my life where like, yeah, <laughs> that all my work got me to a point where, you know, other folks are now kind of seeing that and also wanting to go into that as well. And that is just really special to me. Um, another is that uh, several federal agencies, you know, who have seen my work have also wanted to put on, you know, webinars and um, put out resources on the subject because they, you know, saw that it was such a gap. Um, so FEMA, for example, DHS, also NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, National Integrated Heat and Health System has a website, heat.gov. Um, they put on an overburden and over, um, uh, overlooked a webinar series. And so the first webinar was on LGBTQI plus communities that I organized. Um, so definitely check it out um, if you're interested. That one's on extreme heat. Um, and then looking forward, um, similar to Brandon, I am also going to be uh, going off to a doctoral program at the Yale School of the Environment, where I'll be working with Dr. Michelle Bell and kind of continuing that research and looking at the climate and health impacts on LGBTQI plus populations. And so something that I wanted to mention in my last question, I forgot that I can tie in here is that, you know, uh, looking at like solutions, um, you know, how, what, what are some potential solutions that can create like community resilience and also um, adaptation for climate events and solar energy could potentially be one of those solutions um, because it can provide more resilience during, for example, power outages and also can create those community bonds that have been shown to be extremely indicative of somebody's resilience um, during and after disasters. And so, yeah. Cool, wonderful. Thank you for, for bringing that up too. Um, but yeah, like the, the three of you are so incredible. I'm, I'm like starstruck by the three of you. I think it's so cool to see how much you know, Stella, you in the field going and working with folks in the renewable energy, energy space, the solar space, providing, um, you know, opportunities and uh, connections to the people in our community. And Leo and Brandon, congrats on your programs that you're going into, like more people from our community sitting down, doing that research, seat at the table. You know, it's amazing. So uh, uh, congratulations and thank you for really jumping in there and doing something that needs to be done. Um, so on that positive note that y'all shared and we're all here and all this love, I want to jump into some questions. We got five minutes, so I'm going to jump into, let's see, some of these questions. I'm going to look here and I'm going to say the, the question that we got is, what advice would you give to those working in the space? In the EJ space? Mm -hmm. Uh, whoever wants to jump in, yeah, go for it. I can go ahead and start, uh, Danny. And thank you to uh, those that are um, putting uh, questions in the, the chat there. So I would say what advice um, I would give, um, just break it down, break it down so that folks understand that, you know, it's not just one community that's going through this. It's not, you know, um, you know, straight folks, LGBT plus uh, 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 folks, you know, that, that are experiencing this. Everyone is experiencing climate change. Uh, it's impacting the entire world. And, and so we need to uh, break it down as clearly as possible. Um, and, and, you know, in a respectful uh, way to, to all people that, you know, you have to be part of this effort. You have to, you know, be at the table to start talking about what, you know, your community needs, what types of, of uh, things are impacting your community. And so that would be, you know, the advice that I would, I would share is, you know, just, you know, make it as simple as possible, show people that um, they too will be impacted. And, and hopefully it's not just negatively, maybe it's, you know, finding that job that they're looking for, finding something that is, adds value to their, to their lives. It, it could be here in this space. And to add on to that too, um, I think like it can be a little bit daunting. You're like probably wondering like, where do I start with this? And I think that like, even as somebody who has like lived experience with several identities, although I've never like experienced a climate related disaster, um, 
yet. <laughs> and so I think that like talking with other people and, you know, listening to other people and their stories and their experiences and their perspectives is absolutely key. Um, even like the other day I was talking to somebody and they were telling me like, oh, like my friend, you know, like, is there any research on um, HRT, hormone replacement therapy and like extreme heat? And I was like, no, there isn't. And they were like, oh, my friend has, uh, who takes estrogen gets extremely dehydrated because of that. Um, and like, I didn't know that because I take testosterone. And so just like that moment, I mean, I really like want to, you know, like hone in, like it's all about creating community. It's all about talking with one another. And that's where you're really going to find, you know, the best ways to move forward or like what solutions might work for people. Yeah, I would definitely echo both what Stella and Leo said. Um, I would also comment too that this work is oftentimes daunting and difficult. Um, and I would say on top of that, to not be disheartened uh, while you're in this space. Um, and I would say that also uh, speaking for myself and possibly Leo and Stella as well, is that we don't have all the answers. Um, and like Leo's example, um, there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, LGBTQ people have always been here and we will continue to be here. Um, and so, yeah, it's sort of our job to get the work done in any way we can. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you all for that. And um, I think with that question, that's we, we're at the end of this webinar, um, right? Almost right on the dot. So um, I just want to, again, thank the three of you for being a part of this, doing the work that you're doing uh, and really being pioneers in, for our community in this environmental justice space and, um, and taking the time to be a part of this conversation. You know, we're talking about how we're everywhere and we need to be communicating and things. And I think this webinar really is a part of that. Like we've really talked about something really important. And I, I thank you for the, for the three of you for sharing your voices with us. Um, and then to the audience, thank you for joining. Uh, there will be an uh, email coming out shortly with all this great research that we talked about and important research that we talked about. So please keep an eye out for that and, um, you know, and, and, and let us know what you think. Respond, let us know what you think. And, and I'm, well, I'm happy to relay that to Stella, Leo, and Brandon, if, 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 that, if, if, that, if that's, you know, if you have any questions, any further questions. Um, so thank you to the panelists. Thank you to GRID for, you know, for, for having this, this uh, discussion. Uh, for backing the LGBTQ community and all that you do as well. Um, thank you to the communications team, my HQ communications team. You're the best. Thank you for your support. And um, thank you to all of you for attending and being a part of this. Uh, we need allies everywhere. And for you to be here, uh, whether you're part of the community or allies, you know, we're all here together. And so thank you very much. So with that, thanks, everybody. Have a good uh, rest of your day and happy Pride. Thank you, Danny. Thank Happy you, Pride, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you Brandon. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.